Thank you. 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 Um, yeah. um, Madam Secretary, can we have four? The first thing on the agenda that we're going to do is introduce the H&H &H leadership team, and uh, they're going to present our operational assessment. Sir? Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate everybody, everybody coming. Uh, for the assessment this is being uh, streamed live on facebook i believe the assessment was sent out around 2 30 so everybody should be able to have access to it uh so if, uh, if you haven't i would look on your facebook so our mission h and h's mission is to empowering healthcare excellence uh, we're a retained executive search and healthcare solutions firm we are nationwide coast to coast we have three offices in seattle dc and delaware we work with firms that are small six bed hospitals to large systems like 1200 uh, bed, or 1200 bed hospitals and our goal is to work on helping organizations be better through people process and purpose and we do that by standing shoulder to shoulder we get in the trenches with the organization really understand what their challenges are and then come up with solution sets to help them yes ma'am that was practice. <laughs> so we will start over again. So H and H, we are a retained executive search and healthcare solutions firm. Our mission is uh, stated here is about empowering healthcare excellence. Our focus is really to uh, concentrate on people, process through purpose, and standing and working with you to help your organization be the best that it can be. Uh, we were um, contracted by the board to provide an operational assessment on the organization, looking at everything that's going on with your organization to try to come up with solution sets on how to move you all forward. Yeah. My name is Charles Hall. I am the president of Healthcare Solutions for H&H. &H. Uh, a little bit about my background, I'm a military guy came up through the ranks in the clinical side as a hospital corpsman, as a critical care nurse in the ICU and in the ER. I built and ran emergencies for a long period of time. Um, I've been a chief nursing officer just for a moment, and over the last several years, I've focused on hospital administration as a CEO. Uh, education background, um, I have two masters from John Hopkins University, uh, masters in business association as well as health systems management. I currently live north of Seattle, out of the Seattle office, and uh, know this area well. Our team knows this area well. Some of the members <coughs> of our team are actually from this area. I'm Thomas Steiner. Um, I met many of y'all here. I'm delighted that all of y'all have shown up. Thank you so very much. Um, my background is I was working in a homeless program in Birmingham, Alabama, metropolitan statistical area of about a million. Um, my homeless population are those who are diagnosed with a serious mental illness, chemical addiction, the shelter as long as a participant, a client, participated in their care to help them navigate the homelessness and to break that cycle. During that time, I was exposed to what health care could be. And at the ripe old age of 35, I went back to school and got my master's in health science administration from UAB. I went to, uh, from there, I went down to Mobile, Alabama to a physician-founded hospital, went up to Lewis, Delaware, to a physician-founded hospital, came down to Georgia for a physician-driven hospital, over to Mississippi to a physician-founded hospital, back to Georgia, and then off to Alaska and back here. I have been in rural health care clinics, critical access hospitals, medium-sized hospitals, larger hospitals, physician practices, FQHCs, and thrilled to be here. Looking forward to sharing this information with you. Um, to the board, thank you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Stephen Hartz. I'm a retired naval helicopter pilot. I spent 21 years active duty. I started out as a warheads on warheads guy, blowing things up, and then transitioned over to the medevac side. 
My background uh, as the uh, military kind of led me into leadership development and coaching. Um, I'm a, a master instructor in high reliable organizations, operational risk management, and crew resource management. I really got into healthcare about nine years ago. The Surgeon General of the Navy had brought me back from my search and rescue unit where we were doing all the trauma one medevacs throughout the Pacific Northwest to create a program for military medicine to be high reliable, to get doctors uh, and providers and administration to work together uh, to minimize incidents that have occurred in even military facilities. You don't hear about it much because they don't pay if you sue. All right. Uh, my background, uh, I'm the president of leadership and executive recruitment. Uh, I've worked in about 300 uh, critical access and uh, hospital systems nationwide over the last eight years, uh, doing everything from executive search to leadership development to board education. Um, I am from the DC metro area, Virginia. I am a brat, born ready, always transfer. I've been military my entire life. Thank you very much. We're going to kick this off. Um, as many of y'all know, we talked with everybody uh, and had a delightful time in doing so. And some of the things that I might point to up here, you are more than welcome to read along with. But I want to just highlight a few of them. One of them, uh, the challenges, or perhaps opportunities, we could call them, uh, transparency and leadership. Communication, monitor, manage, expectations follow through on complaints work together as a team not to lose a few slides. behind that line up above is leadership on the line before on the slide before was the staff some of the challenges i'd like to highlight on there is breakdown in silos until we see executive leadership truly empower us to transformational culture we are setting everyone up for frustration communication is key directors be more consistent in holding people accountable now we started out this morning with the staff put those slides up there. There's general agreement, some head nodding. Um, later on, we talked with the medical staff and there was some agreement and nodding. Next slide, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is from 2021 to 2022. Some of the things that we hear today were the same things back in 2021 2022. Now, Please hear, please hear, that culture is not a light switch. Um, culture takes time to move forward. So, yes. So, where do you get um, This is from JDR HR group that came in here um, and talked with 116 staff, 16 leaders in June of 2021 and again in June of 2022. Thank you for the question. Um, but what I want to highlight is there's been work done. There's been progress being made. It is not a light switch. Now, throughout this time that we're here, you're going to hear several themes and I want to highlight those. Something called that this team believes in confidential transparency. I know I spoke with everyone that I did the interview with, that we believe in confidential transparency. We are here to listen to you, to relay the message, and make sure that that is delivered in your voice, not your name. We believe in education and investment. You're going to see this time and time and time again in our recommendations. You're going to hear this at every level. Please listen every level from our staff to our leaders, to the administration, to the medical staff, to our board of trustees, every level. This is complete transparency. I'm thrilled that you're here. I hope you get online and pull this report down. <laughs> The big takeaways I want you guys, uh, everybody to have, is this isn't in the last six months. This isn't in the last two years. 
a lot of these issues occurred pre-pandemic and when we asked the staff was this here those of you who were here before 2019 were these issues here then and they said yes these were issues here we mentioned when we were first here months ago that cultural transformation can take three to five years three to five years it does not happen overnight the very best organizations one of them memorial herman all right phenomenal organization 35,000 employees it took them eight years to go from where they were struggling to where they are now a top 99 percent health hospital next slide please so this is our assessment elements um I'm not going to read them to you but i want you to hear that this is not hmh's assessment this is our listening to you this is your assessment the participants of community members, board members, elected officials, clinical staff, providers, and leaders. This is a synthesis of everyone's opinion about where we are right now. This is a snapshot of May 2nd, 2024. Next slide, please. When you get your report, if you haven't already looked, um, I commend the board. The board, y'all did great. Um, this is how the categories are broken down. Board of Trustees, Executive Leadership, Culture, Leadership, Structure, and Development. It's very systematic. So for those of y'all who have not downloaded it, this is sort of your chapters. You did not learn chapters. Next slide, please. I love this, I love this, I love this. We are all here because of the decisions that are made now or have been made before, or perhaps the decisions that weren't made before. This is a look in the side view mirror, and this will tell you why we're here at this particular moment of May 2nd, 2024, in this assessment. We have very, very, very poor succession planning in this organization. So what that means is when someone leaves, it's like a library burning. A lot of the knowledge is going away. COVID-19 came in and that was a disruption of the pipeline of new ideas, fresh ideas, industry standards, best practices. All of that shut down. What was left was a great team taking care of this community. The retention on them started to dwindle because their, their force power ran out. For those of y'all who were on the force, physician colleagues, who were rendering care, that was a hard burden over those COVID pandemic years. And then the last thing um, is a lack of investment into our community leaders, our leaders that are here in this, in this part right now. Next slide, I'll speak to this. Hey. Um, you know, I'll probably just speak on this. Hey, Patrick. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Hey! <laughs> 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 Right there. Do you like it? No, sorry. Do you like Oh, oh my God. God. Whoa. That's it's the board's decision. What do you want to do? Let Walter Wow. Huh. We are live on YouTube nlj.com if you'll speak up because i am a little bit of far away from you but you won't get that we're recording on facebook are we recording on zoom no your zoom is off they hacked your system yeah but now we will kind of get our attorney 
That's pretty daggum exciting. Um, That's not the word I use. <laughs> No, do you want to have any of the members calling your phone number? Okay. Allison's here. Okay. Allison's here. Okay. Allison's here. Okay. And it's going to, and you mute your phone? Yeah. So here's a second. I got Allison. Somebody's going to get caught. Can't you get, just give us a summary of what, what's going on and skip the slideshow? But no, ma'am. This is why we're here tonight. This is the purpose of the meeting. Oh, yeah. is to have the slides and the whole presentation of the assessment that they're doing for weeks. But can they speak? I mean, they could speak without the pictures. Oh, we can use the pictures. We're just not going to be online there. We'll be online with Walter. Okay. We're just trying to retrieve the other board member that's on Zoom. If they speak up. I may have to go forward. All right, so as a review for governance for function of the board, these are the board's roles. This is their responsibility in, in a not-for-profit system. Uh, and the goal is that the board is diverse and independent, brings a broad range of perspectives, and the high-performing uh, boards consist of members from the community, all over, right? When we talk about legal responsibilities of the board, in any not-for-profit board, you have the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience in any not-for-profit board, and these can be applied in a court of law uh, or by the Internal Revenue Service. What does that mean? Board members are liable if they don't act in the best interest of the organization. Said that the board was responsible for hiring the CEO. Is that yes, ma'am. Wow. Okay. Pretty sad. <laughs> so, board of trustees. Here are the insights, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to highlight some of the strengths of the board of trustees. You have a very engaged board of trustees. You have an active participation in board committees. We're in a lot of hospitals. And the level of participation that your governing board has in committees is commendable. Gordon has employee recognition. There is an employee of the month every month who is recognized by the board. I would say some of the things that we might want to look at. Education needed on governance versus operational instability from high turnover and CEO. Understand this is your unique journey. This is the same journey that a lot of other critical access hospitals are on. Next slide. So what does good look like? When the Board of Trustees embraces best practice to build an agenda, how that might look, might look, is that nine days before a Board of Trustee meeting, the agenda is built for the Board of Trustees 
five days before that, the board packet is ready for the board of trustees to review. That is published out to the community to say, here's the agenda. The packet is ready for the board to review. The board comes in and is ready to do the business of governance. Develop board member orientation and onboarding menu. You will hear this theme repeated often. It is repeated in every leadership role here. We need to invest resources of education and training in those who lead at the board level, at the medical staff level, at the leadership level, and at the staff level. We are all leaders in this community. And develop and adhere to deadlines. We set the deadlines that are reasonable and that we follow. And so there's not this last minute screen. Next slide, please. Executive leadership. The most common leadership style is called that hierarchical. Most of y'all are familiar with that. It is not a chain of command in a derogatory sense. It is a chain of command that allows efficiency and accountability. That's true. The core responsibilities are going to be onboarding, goal development, performance evaluation, personal management, fixed working process improvement, crucial conversations, conflict management, and necessary determination. This is at all levels of organization. So I want to go back to a comment that we made earlier. There are 24 identified leaders in this organization on the organization chart. Seven. Can you speak up? Please. Speak up. 17 of those 24 leaders have less than three years in their current role. So when we go back and we look at that side view mirror to say how did we get to where we are, we can see that we have done very little to invest in our leaders to perform their roles. Our new board that's sitting right here, some of them have tenure, some of them do not. Are we investing in their education in order to provide better governance for us and for this community? Next slide, please. When we talk with everybody, um, many of our leaders were uncertain about the roles that they were holding. How are they to function in those roles? What sort of benchmarking are we using? How are we making our decisions? How are we leading our teams? The very first thing that we would like to emphasize, much like anyone who flies, first put on your mask so you can help someone else. We are a human capital business. Our first emphasis is in that human pillar. Once we get the human resources under control and delivering great human resources that they need to do, then we can start helping this community further and further. One of the things I'd like to address is when you talk about HR, your <coughs> HR department has been ineffective for years. You have job descriptions that have not been updated. You have hundreds of policies that have not been reviewed. You have um, people who don't know what their expectations are while they're at work. And these are the words that we hear from your staff, from your people. And so as you develop this, you have somebody like uh, Sharla, uh, Office of One, until you brought in an interim HR, trying to hold things together for a group of about 200 some odd people. Those are challenges that an organization of this size needs to have solid HR foundation to be able to move forward with all your people and to uh, ensure that they're educated, trained, uh, hired properly, retained. All those aspects going to HR. We talked about culture. We did a cultural assessment uh, a while back. So many of this is uh, uh, repeat familiarization. Strength, um, we've got an engaged medical staff. The, the, we celebrate well. Now we can always improve, don't hear that. This organization celebrates well. There's change occurring. A change is occurring. Uh, some of the things that we would like to see a little bit better, and I'm so sorry, Carrie, you're standing in front of you all the time. Excuse me, man. Um, there's uh, a culture of yes. This is what we're looking for. So when somebody needs something, somebody calls for an appointment, somebody is requesting help. 
we should always be looking for the yes, not the imposition. Always look for the yes. Limited sharing of knowledge in staff leaders or desiring of education. Now, let me back up to colleague uh, Steve's comment. We have three critical areas that have you, you are at risk. One of them is in our quality, one of them is in our human resources, and one of them is in our IT. It's a department of one. Um, we do not expect, nor should we expect, someone to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, attend to every snafu that might happen, um, and be Johnny on the spot. That is unrealistic. It is up to us to broaden that education, share that knowledge, bring in more talent to help broaden that pool, be able to attend to whenever those snafus happen on our screen. I do want to say that we have a, a phenomenal tool called Action Cube. You will hear this again and again and again. Um, the bones of this organization are phenomenal. You have great infrastructure. Action Q is one tool that you have. It's great. Your EMR is a tool. It's great. Um, there's so many things that are going well in this organization. Um, I don't want anyone to lose sight of that simply because we're saying here's how to improve. It doesn't mean that you're horrible on the side of the road. Next slide, please. I would like to add in real quick. So when you see some of these things, staff and leaders want more CEO involvement. We need more rounding. That's a leadership issue. That's leaders moving around, engaging more with the staff to make sure that they're more visible, to understand the issues that are going around the hospital. So these are things that have been pointed out by your staff. And it leads to these um, recommendations. I, I love the slide. And a lot of the slides that we're going to go through, this is not money. This is something easy. This is not money. This is something easy. This is not money. Um, this is how we can improve. And we call it, the first one is called rounding for outcomes. So as a leader, that person would round on their direct reports to say, hey, do you have the tools needed to be successful today? Yes, no. Are there any barriers for you to be successful? As a leader, it's my job to remove barriers so you can be successful in that role. Our director of nursing is going to be going into the patient's room to say, I am looking for you to have a great experience here. Is there anything that we can do to help make this inconvenience in your life a great experience? We're going to have our nurses and our CNAs. I'm sorry, this is a good thing. Thank you. Um, we have to have our CNAs and our nurses um, saying to the patient, Thomas Steiner patient, it's five o'clock right now. I'm going to be back in about an hour and check on you. Sometimes give it take 10 minutes, depending on other patients that I'm taking care of. What this does, the data absolutely proves irrefutably that it prevents falls. So if Thomas Steiner hears from those who are taking care of him, I'll be back in a minute. My mama used to tell me I'll be back in a minute. And I haven't seen her since. I don't know how long a minute is. But if somebody says I'll be back in an hour, if I have to get up and go to the restroom and it's five minutes before, I'm going to stay in the bed until someone comes and checks on me. And then I can go toilet or take care of anything else. Next slide, please. So I'm just curious. I'm sorry, this is a bullet. This what do you mean? Only We're all taxpayers. Can we not speak at board meetings? The, only the board decides who can speak. They who is the director of nursing? 
Next slide, please. <laughs> we don't need a class. We need to know what's going on. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're not here. We don't want to hear your spew. We don't even know you guys. This is our town. We're the taxpayers. We pay. This is why there's so many people here if you haven't it's, it's noticed. <laughs> and you're one of the reasons. Yes. We have an eye on people yes, no that problem. are just like you that's caused this problem yeah. that we got going. I'm and just, you hired them. I am and so that sorry guy there. That these board members hired this CEO. What, yes. What, I'm what saying, a shame. Excuse me. What I'm saying is, is that part of this board meeting, the beginning of the agenda, was to have the presentation from the people that we hired to come here. After the Who hired them, though? The board did. You have nothing better to do than try to drown sir, this hospital? Sir, please. What I'm saying is... That's what that you're doing, and the whole waiting, community knows We're waiting it. for the presentation to be finished, and then we'll be happy to take any comments. Yeah. And how many hours is this presentation? Please, uh, just, I'm, not, I'm not involved with this at all. But I would let them give their talk. I have, have you talked to any board members? I hope you are going to have a public thing on your agenda. Do you? It's on there, sir. Thank you. Make sure they know that. They just have to wait. You just have to wait till this gets done. Go back. <laughs> so I want to point out some of the absolute strengths of this organization. And I would be remiss if we didn't highlight number one which is this entrepreneurial spirit of the leaders in this organization. There's 24 leaders designated on the organizational chart, 17 of whom have not been educated, and they are working their tail feathers off day in and day out to ensure this organization is successful. That is an entrepreneurial spirit. I commend them. I think you should commend them as well. Imagine what could happen if we invest in their education to do their job well. We have some great infrastructure policy step, AccuView, um, the initial investment in a lot of our training about seven years ago. Pre-COVID was done very, very well. Since that time, it's been a little uh, spotty on the care and feeding of that. The potential in the staff is unlimited. Next slide, please. One thing I'd like to address here is like when you talk about organizational leadership from your managers all the way up through directors in your C-suite, when they get selected, they are technical experts. They're the best nurses, the best laboratorians, the best pharmacists. The problem or one of the challenges, there's no onboarding. They get thrust into a leadership position. They don't understand the policies. They don't know how to do evaluations on the staff. They don't know how to have a crucial conversation. And it's challenging when you become a new leader. And this was your friend yesterday. Now you're in charge. And I have to say, no, we can't come 10 minutes late anymore. And I know I have to do it too. There's no onboarding like that. It makes it very challenging to progress an organization to be at the level that you need to be if you don't train those leaders that you have uh, that are phenomenal technicians. I think one of the things that we would point out when we hear, again, you see the things of limited succession planning. Um, many leaders don't understand their roles, the job descriptions, um, damage outcomes, and the single point of failure. Again, bringing that up, the single point of failure. There's nothing new in these patterns. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the leadership structure and our recommendations is really developing your leadership team, creating onboarding practices for your leadership team so they can be the best leaders for your staff, developing them best in leadership education so they understand the goals and their objectives and how to get there. This is one of my favorites, um, so y'all have to bear with me. I um, can't brag on this medical staff enough. Um, they do a phenomenal job, y'all know that. I hope you will tell them that you appreciate them. Um, the medical staff partnership, I'm not the chief medical officers meeting. Um, there is that infrastructure. Uh, policy committee, there is that infrastructure. Joint committee meeting with the governing board, there is that infrastructure. Those are levers to drive quality of care and financial outcomes for the organization. One of the things that we would love to see is that this governing board 
have the opportunity to have voice for the medical staff, the leader of that medical staff, maybe not vote because it's an elected official, um, but the voice of the medical staff would be uh, a good benefit for our lay leaders to hear the clinical side of the government's decisions that we are making. Recommendations on meeting between the CEO and the chief medical officers uh, to review the staff and training programs. Again, that training theme comes in. Who better to know what's needed on the clinical side of care for our community than our physicians? To say, here's where we can beef up, improve, deliver quality of care for our patients than our leaders. Our medical staff. Um, the vital recruitment strategies, this is a great community and it has a unique fingerprint, if you will. Physicians are not widgets. You can't pick one up and put one down. There has to be a great cultural fit with the new physicians, new providers, new staff coming in. So it has to be a thoughtful, deliberate decision. Marketing. Uh, when we came in, we assessed marketing. The ability of an organization to tell a story. The ability to tell the story of great care um, for a patient in the community. The ability to hear this is a great place to work. This machine has come a long ways over the last, say, two months. I hope you all had a chance to dive into Facebook. Hear the story of the staff and the providers and the care that they're providing. We'll see here shortly, the recommendation is continue that great work. In marketing, it's about brand identity, defined messaging, multi-channel approach. So whether it's the website, social media, Facebook, Instagram, or even LinkedIn as a professional website, we have to be firing on all cylinders to be able to tell our value the best. Next. A quick little snapshot right here. In healthcare marketing, we have a couple images. Uh, from a distance, great picture right there. Over here is Monument Health. One feels and looks a little bit more healthcare-like. This would be a recommendation that we update our website a little bit more for the healthcare side. And inside that website, we have education for the community. Think about diabetes or congestive heart failure or links to get into the clinic. Those type of things would all be in here. Next slide. Great work. Uh, I'm not quite sure who has contributed, but many of you have contributed to telling your story on Facebook over the last two months. Um, we spent some time earlier with the staff, and I asked people to raise their hands. Please, next. Today you had, a, a, I believe, a PA tell a story about themselves on Facebook. Your story is extremely important. Tell your story, take your picture, celebrate. That confidence from in this healthcare earns the trust of your community. Uh, great uh, success just in a short period of time. 141%, 22,000 have reached. Uh, almost 3,000, 243% content interaction. Follows have increased up to 207%, which is about 1.4 thousand. That's on Facebook. When I take a look at Instagram, Instagram is probably not as popular around here as Facebook is, but it is a channel uh, for folks. If you've had significant successes, take a look at that. 2.1 thousand contact interactions and over 840% increase on your posts. Next slide. So those recommendations continue social media. Just the fundamentals right here, your website, needs to be updated and for the leaders and the providers and the board professional headshots really get that digital footprint out there okay. absolutely love this love this love this for y'all who are inside these walls this is action key and maybe for me to for those of y'all outside these walls may not be as familiar it's an electronic platform that helps us drive culture helps us to drive Quality helps us to drive instant reporting, helps us to do a myriad of things. As you can see, you find the 
As you can see, the critical count has started in July of 23 and went down to critical count of six. So we are addressing issues. Now, what I hope to see is as we reinvigorate this staff and our leaders, that we put in more and more and more near misses, because those are important as well, into this electronic platform so we can start tracking and trending where our risks might be. And it could be as simple as, it's a ceiling tile, this wet, let me write that down. Well, that may not seem much to you, but if you're in the infection control, that means a great deal. That might not mean much to you, but if you're on the nurse's station where we just had a roof that had a dip in it and we put the shingles up uh, incorrectly, that's important. These are incidents that need to be put in there so we can track, trend, correct, anticipate, and minimize the risk. It's a phenomenal tool. Um, I'm going to brag on Kim. I think she was the one who went out and found this tool. We have shared this tool with the other places that we have been. We feel so strongly about this. So great, great job on Kim. Next slide, please. So there's a quality program. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this governing board is ultimately responsible for the quality of care that occurs in this building. The governing board delegates that responsibility to the organized medical staff. Once again, you have a phenomenal medical staff. They take ownership of the quality of care. You have a great team that when events occur, they look at the root cause to see how we can make it better and address that action cue. Um, one of the things I'd like to brag on is the opportunity that your foundation has for the staff in this building. You've heard repeatedly that, that education is needed. And it's not just simple education. It is specific to their job education. The foundation has indicated that they would like to participate in educating of the staff. So please, as the foundation goes, seeking revenue from all of you, Please contribute heartily so the staff can get some better education. Okay, so this is your quality uh, eight quality program recommendations. Uh, De Director of Quality, one of re identified as a priority is further education. Uh, leaders need to report the partners metrics right now. And the quality director may feel like she owns this quality. Um, she is almost like, for those of us who wear glasses, um, she is helping us to focus, but it's really the departments. Each department owns their own quality. And so each department should be the subject matter expert. They should be the ones reporting to that. 24 hour report, I'm sorry, uh, 24 hour report. For those of us who have children and had the opportunity to have date night, uh, we would leave a message for our babysitter. The 24-hour report is identical to that pattern. We're letting the oncoming staff know exactly what happened in the previous 24 hours. Next slide. We're here for a lot of reasons. One, to provide care to the community. What uh, allows us to do that is regulation. Lots of different types of regulations that are out there. We have uh, the Department of Health is a regulation, CMS is a regulation, and the Office of Inspector General is a regulatory body. And so these are the things that allow us to provide care as an organization to the community. These seven elements, cornerstones to delivering care, must be adhered to. So let's kind of go through it a little bit. Implementing written policies, procedures, and standards. We have challenges. Designating a compliance officer and implementing a compliance committee. We have a compliance officer. We have some work to do in strengthening our community. committee. Conducting effective training and education. There's a challenge there here. Developing effective lines of communication. A challenge there. Conducting internal monitoring audits, performance, benchmarks, a challenge there. 
enforcing standards of conduct through well-publicized disciplinary guidelines, we have a challenge there, and responding promptly to detect offenses and undertake corrective action, those are investigative things, we there too have a challenge. So, yes, we, uh, as we look at uh, kind of the insights of this, we have legal engagement that is a strength here. Um, we are connected to Monument Health, which is our EMR epic, which is an amazing tool. We do need more investment in our compliance program and our leadership. We do need to identify conflicts of interest when they exist and learn to manage them. There are limited audits and monitoring tools in certain areas. Many policies and procedures lack citation, best practices, where the industry is, where you're getting this information. And the ability when evaluating contracts on infrequent fair market value process. So here, training for the program. We have the basics of a program. We need to strengthen our compliance program, develop more monitoring tools, and then truly bring in an expert who truly understands all aspects of compliance to help us build this program. Yes. Action cube. Education. Action cube. Education. Um, you have engaged risk officer. Um, Action Q is just a phenomenal tool. We'd love to see this used more and more and more and more. Um, one of the things we talk about is the consistent top of mind of near misses. Near misses are just as important as safety events. Um, if we can capture all of the near misses, we can prevent the safety events. Uh, not all complaints or grievances are escalated and investigated. Instant reporting is not robust. And one of the things that, that we don't seem to do as well is closing that loop on the actions that have been taken. So if I make this complaint, I may never hear anything that goes into some sort of uh, black box, if you will. Um, there needs to be closing of the loop to say, thank you very much. So I'd like you to please understand, and, and I hope this resonates with you, so many of the decisions that are made by a board or an administration are really a factor of the amount of risk your organization is willing to take. Are you willing to accept the amount of risk? If you have somebody doing something wrong, are you as a hospital willing to take on the risk and be subject to millions of dollars of lawsuits. Most people would say no, but it's important that the risk, the compliance, the regulatory program, all those programs go into the decisions that are made by the board and the leadership team. And oftentimes those are the hardest things to understand is what really is the risk and how much can they tell you about what the risk is without putting the hospital in a libelous situation where now Everybody knows, and we just opened ourselves up to a lawsuit. So develop a roadmap for team certified professional health care risk management for some reputable like certification. Develop, educate, and training. This is the see one, do one, and teach one. Once our leaders are trained, then it's incumbent upon them to share that education with the staff, with those leaders, to say this is what compliance looks like, this is what risk looks like, this is what safety looks like, this is what privacy looks like. Next slide, please. Privacy and security. Um, I want everyone in here at this table and those on the outside of this table to recognize you have a phenomenal tool in EPIC. For those of y'all who might be a patient here, or for those of us who might be a patient here, no one can get into your medical record without an electronic fingerprint or who access to your record, date, time, and duration. It is a phenomenal tool. EPIC is continually updating that and pushing that information out as to the monitoring of it, what is best practices. So you have 
top of the line ability here in this organization. Is that through monument? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we don't do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You did great. They do okay. a great job. Okay. Um, legal engagement is one of your strengths. Many organizations that we interact with, there is a lawyer that is called when the barn's on fire. Um, that's probably, that, that's one way to do it. That's, that they're accepting the risk to make those decisions. Um, your, your governing board has engaged the lawyer to help keep the barns from catching on fire. Roles and responsibilities of our security officer and our compliance officer, we need to tighten those up. Um, it is not out of malice by any stretch of the imagination. I promise you, your leaders in here are absolutely phenomenal. Um, we should, um, administrative IT access requires defining. Um, we have one person here in IT, and she has done an extraordinarily good job. She would have done an extraordinary good job if we only had ethics, but we have 10,000 other IT events that need interfacing connectivity. They're constantly dropping off. We need new passwords. We've timed out the myriad of the electronic world has pulled her in every which direction. So when you see Mindy, please pat her on the back and say thank you. She's done a great job. There needs to be several more Mindy's. When you see Charlotte, pat her on the back. We need plenty more Charlottes. When you see Kim, pat her on the back. We need plenty more Kim. Next slide, please. To kind of dive into this, just, just to reiterate on what Thomas is saying, when you look at these pro, uh, programs like HR, like IT, like quality compliance and risk, and you have three people, and all of that responsibility and risk falls on just those three people individually. It takes time to develop. You can't just go out and hire people left and right, because again, it's not about finding just the body. It's finding the right person with the right cultural fit in the organization so you can have that success. Again, investment. Let's get some benchmarks. Develop 24 hour report. Daily safety huddles. We're kicking this off. We've been doing this for a little bit. And it is just that five to 10 minute hey, is there anything unsafe in the interior? We want to make sure that you're. Delivering safe, high quality care in the organization. Love this, love this, love this, love this, love this. Um, passion experience. So, this is probably my expertise. Uh, if, if there is one, um, right now we are using Feed Trail. If you're not familiar with Feed Trail, I invite you to visit with Kim to give you a quick overview of that. I've just already told her for a lot of time. So please, please, please get your account. Feed Trail is an electronic on your cell phone that you can instantaneously let this organization know what your encounter was like with someone at the clinic, the Newcastle Clinic, the Nutley Clinic, at the hospital, our outpatient. You can absolutely give them the five-star rating or the two-star rating. You can free text in there, comments. And we absolutely look at 100% of these. This is this started out in November. November, um, and we're at 850. So please, please, please know that this is a venue for our patient. Next slide, please. And it would have been interesting to see how many votes may have changed because of Gordon's actions because of the response of their communities after those bills were passed, specifically the gun free zone bill. I think that I think that we would have very much seen a change in votes on that one. I think you would have seen more nay votes on that than you had before. Are so you're saying that uh that some folks were counting on the governor veto in that one. I very much 100% think that especially school districts, courthouses, places like that were banking that the governor was going to go, no way are we letting guns in these areas. 
And, and I think that their response afterwards may or may not have swayed some of those representatives and senators to vote a different way because the response was strong. This is a venue for our patient next time. So patient insight, staff recognition programs, you're doing a great job. We're doing more. We're starting with the Daisy coming out. Um, feed trails is a strength. Employee to patient ratio is a strength. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, maintenance, housekeeping, and dietary is a strength. Unless you have MD or DO attached to your name, you have no ability to judge the quality of care. But every one of us has invited somebody over to their home, and that per or may have been you going to someone else's home, and you look around their house, if their house is dirty, do I want to eat there? I judge quality of care by how clean that room is. I judge quality of care if my coffee is hot when it should be. I judge quality of care that my jello is cold when it should be. Those are the things we know. We don't know if we're at the right milligram or some dosage. We don't know that. And we don't know if that's the appropriate thing. We trust. We absolutely trust and they have earned that trust. But we judge on what we can see, smell, and taste. Next slide, please. So I want to develop a program uh, on closing the loop of every complaint and develop a program what's called aiding. Uh, for those of y'all who have been in healthcare a while, it is acknowledged. Tracy. Tracy. Acknowledge. Hey, Tracy. My name is Thomas. Introduce. Nice to meet you, Nice, to, nice to meet you, Tracy. So AIDIT is Acknowledge, Introduce, Duration. I am going to be your fifth audience today. I'm going to draw some blood. It's just going to be a little bit of time. A little bit of time. Now, the duration. The doctor has ordered a test that's going to take about two hours for the results to come back. You're setting exclamation, exclamation, and Tracy, thank you for the doctor. Thank you. <laughs> every patient encounter, every encounter at the clinic, hate it, hate it, hate it. Um, up top, absolutely adore up top. So Thomas Steiner sitting there as a patient, and my coffee is cold. So I say to the person attending me, my coffee is cold. Now, we, the person attending me has two options. One option is to say, you know, it's all the time. Or, 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 you know, Thomas, I'm so sorry that your coffee is cold. McKaylee in dietary is always looking at process improvement. May I do something? May I go find McKaylee and bring her here so she hears from you how we do not meet your expectation? And you're not going to hurt her feelings because she wants to do what's best for you in this situation. McKaylee comes in, she says, hey, Thomas, what happened? My coffee is cold. Well, how can I help? I don't know how to keep coffee hot. Well, while I try this, next time you order coffee, I'm going to make sure that mug is warmed up before I pour in hot coffee so it will stay hot while we bring it to you. And then I'm going to ask you, was your coffee hot? Those are two entirely different encounters. One of them is up talk, talking about your great colleagues that you work with. The other one is going underneath the bus. Next slide. Your EMR, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, your EMR is phenomenal. Your EMR, your patient information is secure. There's nothing that's going to happen with that. It's, there, there isn't a date, time, duration stamp on there. One of the things that I'd like to see is a little bit more education on the EMR uh, across disciplines. So people become super users. When you go into, say, an academic teaching center, you will see nurses in like red shirts. 
uh, instead of the normal shirt that they have. That is sort of the visual to say, I'm a super user in this unit on this equipment. We would love to see a whole lot of super users in this network. Well, this is in, in a nutshell, just a tiny, tiny snapshot of who we are. This is the services we uh, provide, primary care, urgent care, emergency care, all the way through ancillary services lab and radiology. Next slide. The conversation that we can be having, I know there's a lot going on now, and as we think about who we want to be, that visionary thing, general surgery, orthopedics, family medicine, cardiology, dermatology, gastronomy, EMT, behavioral health, internal medicine. These are the things we want to talk about as well. How do we keep here local? How do we bring in outside specialists to be here, maybe not in a full-time way, maybe once a week or every other week. How do we bring that here so compliance to care? I got to see my doc. It's too far away. I don't want to see the doc. The doc is coming to me here in town. I'm going to go see my doc. Now I can get better care. In the future, I would love to see you start talking about where you want to go as an entity, as an organization, what additional services that the CEO and the providers can partner up to evaluate what specialties need to be in. Real quick. So when you don't have the services that you could have, what is your community going to do? We're going to vote with this. <laughs> they're going to use their keys and they're going to drive to Gillette or Rapid City or another place that has these services. Now, is this going to be a place that does complex brain surgery? Probably not. But can this be the place where you get your initial cardiology care, you go maybe for surgery, and then you can come back here to recover? Those are all options that you have. Or your community is going to vote with their keys and go to another hospital. And that's going to take the volumes down, which is going to drive things down for your organization. Thank you very much. Here in a moment, we do get a look at the finances. It's a good thing. We want that. But in the finances, is volume. And volume does equal revenue. And the complexity of care specialty equals additional revenue. And so as we look at that revenue, we're looking at volumes. So we're flat. Next, next slide. The goal is to have a yes culture. The goal is when a patient calls, I find a way to say yes. Either put them on the calendar in an efficient way, get them through the door, find a way to say yes to this culture. This theme challenges and growth mining. And it's not the individuals we're talking, we're talking about the culture. Our goal is to grow to add these specialties so that care can stay local. And I know we've talked a little bit about single points of failure that could interrupt or delay care. We have that here as well. To do this, it requires inclusiveness from the organization. It requires the providers and the administrators, the staff and the community to work together to determine it, what it is you need. What does the community really need? And from there, you all work together to develop out that future set of what those capabilities will be. Where are we in the industry of health? There's a category called population health. Um, in many ways, where we're evolving, where today we wait for the patient to come to us, where they need to be helped in healing from illness or injury. This population health initiative is across the board. It's affecting the way hospitals are reimbursed. It is about a place of a community center, a place where people can come to learn about their, their care, about diabetes, about congestive heart failure, preventative health. This right here, we get advanced reimbursement as an organization for these type of initiatives. I'm not asking everybody to raise their hand if they're 50 or above. But those that are 50 above, when did you get your last colonoscopy? Those are those type of proactive, preventative things that we have to start focusing on and grabbing those services to look at our community and properly care for it. So some of these are recommendations right here. Uh, education. We have platforms like social media. So grab a provider, grab a nurse, put it in front of the camera, record, push it out, talk about diabetes. 
educate the community on healthy eating, healthy lifestyle, how to handle your congestive heart failure. Outreach, go to the schools, go to the community centers, uh, go to the senior center and educate there. And I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. I right hear Healthy People 2030 has a framework that tells us how to do that. Good fun, good fun. Um, we're going into the financial uh, management section of this. Um, absolutely great stuff. Um, unless you have the MD or deal behind your name, quality of care is sort of a good thing. Uh, I promise you, the two gentlemen in here are scientists. They geek out on quality. Uh, for the rest of us, we understand what a dollar is, right? That makes sense to us. So this is the good stuff for us. I want to start off by saying, uh, in your audit in 2019, which starts in June 1 of 2018 to June 30 of 2019. So your audit in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022 has said the exact same thing talking to uh, Charles's comment on risk. This is risk that's acceptable. So, a material weakness is a deficiency or combination of deficiencies in internal controls such that there is a reasonable possibility, not probability, possibility, that a material misstatement of the entity's financial statement will not be prevented or detected and corrected on a timely basis. That's the monthly basis. So, that sounds awful. All of us pay taxes. On April 15th, we send in a check for taxes. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February. We may not be pulling out the exact amount for the taxes owed. We may not be accumulating our tax deductions. But on April 15th, we're going to make sure they are accurate. That makes sense to all of us in this room. That's what the audit does is to help recalibrate that on this specific date, the numbers are right. Now, there's income, money coming in, and there's money that we pay out. Every month, this governing board hears to the penny how much money came in and how much money went out. Jennifer gives that report. She keeps a track on that. And that is a phenomenal tool that this governing board has. And income will not become an expense, and expense will not become an income unless you're in wrong, right? It just ain't going to happen. Now, the general ledger codes it may change. Hey, you've got this is a wrong general ledger code for expense. Let's move that up or let's move that down. So, this is the criteria that our auditors say that internal controls are the responsibility of management. The cause that we don't have the internal controls is we don't have a CPA sitting back there, an accountant sitting back there, absolutely managing with an abacus with a sleeve rolled up and the, and the visor on, counting every jot and tittle as it comes through. This situation is common for entities of this size, and the auditor's recommendation is periodically, every year when this audit comes out, the governing board, are you willing to accept the risk that it's going to be right at the end of the year, or do you want to have somebody in there with the visor making sure it's right every day? And there's a cost to that, there's a benefit to that, and that's the decision of the risk. Next slide, please. So, what does good look like? Well, 
you got great participation on the finance committee from the board of trustees. You got a great oversight from the team that's back there in your accounting offices. Your AP person, accounts payable person, is not your AR person, the accounts receivable person. They're two different people. There's somebody overlooking that, and then there's somebody overlooking that. You have methods to ensure that things are safe. Um, cost report, we've talked about this a, a bunch. Um, critical access hospital cost-based reimbursement. So in very simplistic terms, for every Medicare patient that comes in and care for this rendered is reimbursed, presumably at 1% above the cost of rendering that care. The federal government has made the rules unfair in your favor. And that is because if this organization does not exist, individuals in this community will not survive. The federal government knows that, and so they make the accounting unfair in your favor. Next slide, please. So this is your volumes. These are actual data from the audits. Um, we talked earlier with the team. Um, there are 10 metrics that was put out by a think tank in Minneapolis way back when. And they said, here are the 10 things that you need to pay attention to is in your board packet. Um, and there are some that there, there's one or two that I, I may or may not agree with. That's okay. This governing board needs to keep their pulse on the organization's finances. Here are nine that we think is appropriate. And your packet is also the 2020 standard, the median. 50% had numbers below it. 50% had numbers above it. The median numbers. That's probably meaningless. That's 2020 data. We're in 2024, but that's the latest, last data that was presented. But the governing board may want to look at is say, okay, in 2019, our accounts receivable was 72 days. In 2020, it was 69 days. 2021, it's 55 days. 2022, we're down to 53 days. And the operational side of it may want to get with the financial team back there and say, what processes can we do? What realistic goals can we set? And let's set those goals and see if we can achieve those. That's just one option. I want to say patient care, profit, and loss. Please hear this. You do not have an expense problem. You will not cut yourself into prosperity. Please eliminate that from your thinking. If it's cost-based reimbursement, the cost that we have in taking care of Medicare patients is reimbursed. Please, please. Now, there's efficiencies that we can do. Don't hear that. What we have is revenue opportunities. So if I have a nurse taking care of a patient, I have to pay that a nurse fair market wages. If I have two patients, I still have a nurse that can take care of two patients at fair market value. That's the way we need to think about how do we drive the revenue, how do we drive the volumes, and that does not begin with anybody in this table unless the medical staff has a seat. Well, I want to, sorry, I want to point out a couple things. Uh, from 2017 to 2022, there were 56 critical access hospitals that closed nationwide. 56 critical access hospitals. Of those, 50 of them had a negative patient care profit or loss. 50 of them. You guys have a negative patient care profit or loss. 52 of them had less than 30 days cash on hand. In 2022, you had 10 days cash on hand. What does that mean? It means there's a jeopardy there. It means that the organization has to be more efficient and effective. We have to drive volumes and bring people back here to stop them going from other places so they feel confident and trust the providers, the nurses, the staff here to keep this hospital going, to stay as an independent entity. Otherwise you end up like other hospitals in Montana that were bought out by Billings Clinic 
and then you have someone 400 miles away telling you how your healthcare is going to be. The goal is to keep patients and patient care local. So those are the numbers that we are focusing on to drive those up to keep your hospital viable. So this is patient care profit loss. And the line above it is the overall cost of care loss. Uh, some of the numbers seem extraordinarily big, and that is from COVID funds, probably their debt being forgiven because they were used appropriately to render good care. Um, down below, you can see that our volumes really haven't improved a great deal throughout the years, and th these are actual volumes in fiscal year 2023. We don't know the finances. The audit has not been done. Um, I will say that uh, from a customer service standpoint, in fiscal year 2023, we had 12,000 opportunities to deliver great customer care to individuals in this community of 7,000 people. So let's do a great job delivering great customer care so it stays local. Next slide, please. Recommendations. Uh, our best practice would be um, that our leaders in this community or uh, in, in our hospital understand the financial statement. They haven't been trained on that. They haven't seen that. It is no slam on the finance department. Please don't hear that. We're not laying blame anyway. What we are saying is they don't have the tools to be fiscal stewards of the resources that they are being entrusted. And we need to make sure that they have that. Um, establish reasonable goals. So the governing board is going to say our quality needs to be this. Let's say X. And then the governing board will meet with the CEO and say, CEO, we believe that the quality needs to be X. The CEO is going to meet with this leadership team and say, quality needs to be X. How are we going to do it? What part are you going to play in getting to X? And then those leaders are going to talk with their teams to say, our goal is quality of X. How are we going to get to it? That's called cascading a scorecard down. So your hospital foundation is a great way for your community to engage with your hospital. There are things that the hospital wants to buy that they may not have the funds for, and that's a great aspect for the hospital foundation. Hospital foundations are normally made up of community members that want to participate and figure out ways to help the hospital get more. We've seen everything from providing baby blankets to providing a brand new ambulance to providing a new entryway. In the past, you guys have had great foundation um, response. You see the tiles out there, you see the walls, and it's getting that foundation back up and running because that could be a huge help to the organization to help drive volumes back. There's also opportunities for grants for foundations that are not available to the hospital, but only for the foundation to help meet the needs of your community. So when we talk about a collaborative partnership, what does that look like? It's having projects ready. It's the organization, it's the providers, it's the nurses and the staff saying, hey, you know, we really need new beds. We really need a new ambulance. And then having those things listed, costed out, so when opportunities come with the foundation or a grant, that the foundation can go after it. We have worked with organizations in Montana and Colorado that have gotten millions of dollars in grant money to provide exactly that. Brand new ambulance, brand new bays for their ambulance, a hangar for uh, a helicopter that comes when they have um, air evacs. All sorts of things that the foundation can do that the hospital simply cannot on their own. And these are a list of the priorities and the CEO and the foundation president should work together and they should work to help uh, build the foundation up for the community. One of the things that I want to bring to your attention, we've hit the highlights. Um, this report has a lot more depth to it. I invite you to please read it, take a look at it, look at the recommendations. This governing board is going to decide what the next step might be and prioritize those next steps. That's the job of the governors. Um, it really is uh, an opportunity for you to get the need of hood for what this organization looks like on May 2nd, 2024. 
I know it's hot in here. We're coming to an end. A couple closing remarks. Uh, have some questions and answers. What we want to be able to say is there are some challenges, but the quality care is good. The people delivering that care and supporting the care is good. I need you all to hear that because when you pick up a report like that, you're like, oh my goodness, it's all raining down ugly. It isn't raining down ugly. The care is good here. The programs need some work. Some partnership and collaboration needs to happen. This report is designed to guide the board and the CEO in a common direction to build this organization to the next level. When we talked to many of the staff out there uh, today, we talked about what is the organization? Are they struggling? Are you all really in that dire strait? And they said, there, no, we're not. So many things are going great. There are some challenges. But a lot of the challenges are outside, not necessarily inside, right? So this organization is working towards the future. What does that future look like? The board, the elected members of your board, your administration team work hand in hand. Administration works on operations, the day to day. The board works on governance, fiduciary and quality to make sure you can get to what the community needs, right? The objectives of this presentation and this assessment is not uncommon for you all. We've gone into large organizations, UT Southwest. There's is hundreds of pages. Everybody has challenges, but it's good to know where you're at, so where you can work at. So in the future, I'm sure in the future, you will have another assessment in some way, shape, or form. You want to know that you're continuing to make progress towards what's good. Um, if you look back over on that wall, you have that service excellence standard. That was something that was developed here by your staff years ago. Years ago. Most healthcare systems, they train, they educate, but they fail to sustain, right? How many of you nurses and providers have started on a program and you get taught something and it's great and then all of a sudden it just falls by the wayside? Don't allow your challenges to fall everything by the wayside. Work together as a unit to get you back towards your service excellence standards that you have already defined. Some of the things we're looking at next steps, recommendations. Detail review with the CEO, the CEO and the board, detail going through this page by page to look at. Working on prioritizing with the board and the leadership on where are the priorities and what needs to be addressed. Typically, priorities go by safety, right? What will shut us down and then everything else below that. A roadmap with timelines. You all want transparency. The roadmap is that guide to transparency on where the hospital is going and you as a community hold them accountable for that roadmap. Q&A with the board. We recommend that the Q&A or town hall meetings are done with the leadership team and the community to answer the questions you might have. There is a lot of information. Board education and development. Existing board members and new board members coming on. Nobody wakes up in the morning when they're 16 years old and says, I want to be the board member on a hospital board. They don't do that. Most of them don't have education and training in healthcare. So there's a requirement to get educated and trained because remember, you have those responsibilities and you are legally liable, all right? Leadership and education and development. I don't think we can say it enough. Stop my foot, stand on a table. Leadership and development, top to bottom. From your CEO down to everybody else. Everybody needs leadership and development. Leadership and development is something that occurs every day. It's not a one and done. You didn't go get your degree and all of a sudden you have a bachelor's degree in finance, you're the smartest person in the world. You have to work at it over and over. Advisory and strategic planning. Where do you want to go? How are you going to get there? That is a board ev uh, evolution and then strategy implementation. Do you have the tools and resources right now within your organization to execute your strategy? Right? Do you have the people? Do you have the knowledge? Do you have the capability or capacity? Figuring that aspect out. 